Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss a case of a relatively rare tumor in the breast uh, based off of a biopsy. Uh, so keep in mind this is non-excision. Um, but here we go. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma of the breast. Um, so what do we know about squamous cell carcinoma of the breast? Well, they are part of the metaplastic carcinomas and it is an extremely rare tumor to have as a primary breast cancer. Um, essentially all these are keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas. They tend to be fairly well um, differentiated um, and because of that and because of how much they look exactly like their uh, derm path counterparts, we really have to exclude metastatic lesions. Um, so when we think squamous cell carcinoma, as I just drive around a little bit here, so you guys can really appreciate how prominent the keratin is in this case, uh, we want to think about areas such as the lung, uh, the uterine cervix, bladder, and head and neck cancers, right? Um, places where we see a lot of squam. There we go. This is what I wanted to show you guys. Okay. Um, and so why are we excluding that? Well, because uh, squamous cell carcinoma looks similar regardless of where it is. Um, so these patients might actually have like a really remote history that may not be apparent when you get the biopsy. Um, so you want to check with your clinicians um, because maybe they have remote history and uh, that'll make things a lot easier. So rather than giving them a rare, very rare cancer by saying this is primary breast, you're, you might be able to differentiate and say, hey, this is metastatic from wherever the patient had a previous history. Uh, something else that you should consider as we start looking at some of the histology is uh, patients who are under immunosuppression. So like patients with Crohn's or uh, well, Crohn's is the one that comes to mind. Um, patients that, oh, sorry. Good reminder to mute everything as you record. Um, uh, they can be using things like uh, azathioprine, uh, which can make them more liable to have squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so what makes this squame besides all that prominent keratin? keratinization, so that very um, dense pink uh, material that uh, kind of has like a, a weavy texture to it. So what I'm showing you here is this is the squamous cell portion of the lesion. So what we have are these uh, somewhat polygonal s cells uh, that have really well-defined cell membranes. There's abundant eosinophilic or pink cytoplasm and what's really nice in this area is when you look between the cells you can actually make out all the spinous processes and if you're ever looking at a tumor going hey is it possible that this is a squam uh, when you see those spinous processes between the cells, because that's how they're holding on to each other, that's what makes squamous cell carcinoma stick together, um, that's, that's what you're looking for. Um, what else do we have in this field? We have a really gnarly looking mitotic figure uh, to the mid right of this field, and you just see that some of these cells are pleomorphic, and by pleomorphic we mean they don't look like each other. Um, so, uh, the best way to think about pleomorphism is if you're in the grocery store and you're looking at potatoes, potatoes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, um, but when you look at them, they're all relatively round, they might be a little bumpy, um, but they all look the same. Whereas if you go over to the section where they have all the gourds, um, you'll have like your butternut squash, you could have spaghetti squash, uh, your zucchinis, but they're all different shapes, sizes, colors, uh, even textures. And so think gourds when you're looking at things going, is this pleomorphic enough? Okay. Um, but is this enough for us to say, oh, hey, this uh, this is 
moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated, and pretty much how uh, I've learned to look at squamous cell carcinomas is if I can look at it and I know, like, oh, here's a nice, looks like a nice keratinization right there. Um, this brings us to another point about squamous cell carcinomas, but if I can look at a tumor and I say, this looks squamy, I have keratin, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that this looks like a squamous lesion, then to me that is well differentiated. If you're looking at something and you're like, I have no idea where this is from, that's when you would consider, okay, this is a poorly differentiated and moderately differentiated somewhere in between, and that does vary from person to person. Um, so what I have almost dead center here for you guys is, um, you see how that one cell has more intensely pink cytoplasm? It's more of like a, a Pepto-Bismol rather than the fluffy cotton candy pink. Um, so this is dis, uh, a dyskeratotic cell or an apoptotic body, and all that means is, hey, this is still squamous differentiation, and if you were thinking maybe this is just a reactive process, this should push you over into, okay, there's, there's some sort of dysplasia going on. I need to look a little deeper, okay? So whenever you see these very intensely eosinophilic squamous cells, um, that's, that's what they mean. Okay, so what else about squames? Well, they tend to be large lesions. Okay, and what do we mean by large? Well, they're going to be anywhere from like one centimeter up to 12, 13 centimeters. So these are huge lesions. Okay, and because they like to keratinize, they're going to be very much like an epidermal inclusion cyst. So they're going to be very soft, squishy. If they have a lot of keratin like this, possibly pretty... Uh, chalky and, and gross as you're dealing with them grossly. Uh, what else? On imaging, the imaging doesn't really help you with these. Um, they don't have specific margins. They can uh, look like an abscess, so if we look down here you can kind of see why. Uh, we start seeing all, all this inflammation in here and it's, it's a mixed inflammation. Okay. Um, this lesion in particular, uh, they thought they were actually tapping into a hematoma. So, oh, okay, this is another great area. So what you see at low power, and I, I always encourage uh, residents and students, we always want to go to high power, but try to also look at low power, um, because what you really appreciate at low power is this beautiful um, dark blue uh, in, um, in some areas, like they would, they would refer to this as like the eyeliner effect. It's not really. This is um, what you have: is the dark blue cells, the bigger dark blue cells. Those are your um, basal keratinocytes, and they just tend to be more prominent. And that's something that you kind of lose at high power. If you see here, if I go up to even just twenty x, that same vis visualization that you were able to see very easily at 4x is somewhat lost at 20x. So um, as, as tempted as we are to always go high power, to always go 20, 40, uh, if you're looking at cytology and, and heme path, they will go up to like 100x. Um, you always want a low power lesion too to get a, a sense of overall architecture. Um, but okay, what else can we say about these? Well, this is a biopsy. So, um, on biopsies, you shouldn't necessarily outright call this is primary breast. And why? Um, well, several reasons. So, uh, you can have a lot of squamous metaplasia in the breast. Um, you can have skin lesions involving the breast that maybe, again, you don't know about. So, uh, you want to make sure that if there is skin involvement, that it's only focal, it's not um, the entire lesion, um, and they're really going to deal with these surgically. So if they're small enough that they can do uh, a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy and decide afterwards whether they're going to give the patient chemotherapy or radiation, and just drive on a little bit so you guys can, can really appreciate the morphology of this tumor. Um, uh, 
they might do that. Um, but because a lot of these lesions tend to be very big, they're going to do mastectomies more often than not with these. So in this field, you can see a lot more of those in intense eosinophilic apoptotic bodies. Um, they're kind of just scattered all over. We got some, some wild mitotic figures in there again um, that you can just really appreciate. Um, because this is a squame too, like we also see in this field, there's a lot of cells that look cleared out, right? Um, so you can have uh, glycogen deposition like you can anywhere else. Um, always tend to see a lot of this in uterine cervix. Uh, that just happens with age. But you can have uh, clear cell features in, in these squamous cell lesions where you have a prominent clearing of the cytoplasm. So don't let that scare you. Don't let that fool you. Remember you're looking for those uh, spinous processes and if it has that, then we're going to think squamous cell uh, with clear cell change versus like a, a clear cell uh, carcinoma or sarcoma, okay? Um, when you're looking at your stains, these are, these are squames, right? So uh, you can do your P63, not overly helpful because what else in breast is P63? Our myoepithelial cells, right? Um, when we think lung, we always think P40 for squamous cells, um, but there's not a lot of literature on that in the breast. Um, your cytokeratin, so whether you're doing CK5-6, CK7, 34, beta-E12, uh, you could even just do like a pan-cytokeratin, like an A1, A3, um, all those are going to be positive. Um, you, can, you can see positivity with EMA, and um, most of these lesions will also uh, express EGFR, um, which has a little to do with their uh, suspected molecular phenotype. Um, because these are squame lesions, right, they're not breast glands, um, they're going to be ERPR negative. However, about 10% of them or so will be HER2 positive. That really only comes into play with how they can treat patients, right? If we have HER2 positivity, then they can look at, can we give uh, HER2 targeted therapies? Can we give trastuzumab? Those kinds of things. Uh, going back to the molecular, so EGFR, so this is related to amplification. So, and there's, there's a lot of different things that are out there. So whether it's increased copy number or there's been uh, some discussion of like trisomy seven, um, that could be a role for this in the breast. Uh, another thing to consider is some of these lesions will express human papillomavirus or HPV, um, which, I mean, in other areas we tend to see them with non-keratinizing or basaloid type squamous cells, um, but you can see that in a small percentage of your breast squamous cell carcinomas. Um, what else? That's kind of it. These patients, so even though these are really rare tumors and the data they have for uh, long term is only at about 10, 15 years out, their 10 year survival tends to be about 80, 85% with metastasis and it's about 50% if they have lymph node metastasis. Um, these are tumors so they should do uh, sentinel lymph nodes, axillary dissection as needed um, per the NCCN guidelines, but because these are rare tumors, there are really no specific NCCN guidelines to follow in regards to treatment. So some of these patients might get radiotherapy, um, some of them might get uh, chemotherapy, and again, if they have that HER2 positivity, sorry, can't speak first thing in the morning, um, then we're also going to look at those uh, her two targeted therapies. Um, but this is just a really nice case of a really rare lesion. And if you're wondering why I'm saying for sure this is squamous cell carcinoma of the breast when I told you this is biopsy only and not excision, um, well, this is actually a recurrent lesion in this patient. So that's how we know what we're dealing with. Um, but I think it'll be really interesting to see on excision what this looks like and where they're going to go treatment-wise. And hopefully I'll be able to update, uh, update the series with that excision when it comes out. Um, that's all I have for today. So if you guys 
like this video, hit like, hit subscribe. Uh, if I missed anything or said anything incorrectly, please let us know in the comments so that everybody can learn, I can learn. Um, you know, I say all the time that I'm I'm still learning all this stuff, I'm still a trainee myself, so um, we can only grow together if um, we all help each other out and share our collected knowledge. Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you.